Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Grace Byrne, and I am here today with my co-host, my service dog, Judge. And we would like to talk to you about nonverbal communication that we use as a service dog handler team. Because we are in a nonverbal communication class, I thought it would be appropriate to not struggle with one of my deficits, visual impairment, to decipher written text and read to you what I have prepared, but instead use another form of nonverbal communication as stated in the Lee and Joshi 2019 article entitled Computers Can Talk For Us Now. This article describes how text-to-voice synthesis is a form of nonverbal communication. Judge and I will explain to you how we use nonverbal communication to, well, communicate with each other, and with the public, when necessary. In the following presentation, we acknowledge there are multiple forms of nonverbal communication displayed in each clip or image, but we will draw your attention to the one we would like to discuss. Let's get started. The first form of nonverbal communication we would like to discuss is touch. Touch, also known as haptics, is a form of nonverbal communication that is stated in our textbook is the perception and use of touch as communication. The perception of touch can result in good or bad impressions being made. In this video clip, I am shaking hands with my service dog judge. In our textbook, we learn that something as simple as holding hands with somebody else is enough touch to stimulate the relaxation response of lowered heart rate in an individual. I acknowledge that Judge is not a human, but the short clip of us shaking hands demonstrates that the pair of us have the capacity to touch each other, be it hand holding or brushing against each other's fur and skin when we walk. I can only speak for myself, but having him inadvertently brush against me is reassuring to me, steadies my gait, and it helps calm me down from any thoughts or anxieties that might be preoccupying me. In the short term, I think that having the daily touch of my service dog is both stress relieving and gives me something to focus on. In the long term however, I think the touch we give each other can help diffuse a potentially dangerous situation. For instance, if somebody insists on meeting Judge's eyes while we are out walking, I can place my hand on his shoulder blade to help remind him that he needs to ignore the eye contact and focus on helping me not run into something that I cannot see. From experience, I can tell you what can happen if he is distracted, and it is not great. Likewise, if I become upset, Judge may jump up across me, pressing his body weight into me. The pressure can help center me as we will discuss later. The next form of nonverbal communication we will discuss is emblems. Emblems are a form of nonverbal communication using gestures as substitutes for words. In class, we were given the example of a thumbs up. This clip shows me giving hand motion commands to judge, which he promptly carries out. This is an example of the use of emblems. The gestures made, the specific hand motions that I was using, are culturally specific and symbolic for service dogs, and they learn how to react to them in their training. These emblems have direct verbal translations and precise meanings. In this example these are watch me, sit, and down. These specific gestures were encoded intentionally when they were taught to judge. In the short term, I find these emblems to be helpful when needing to tell my service dog to adopt a certain posture non-verbally or as a non-verbal reinforcement to verbal commands if we are in a situation that is distracting to him. In the long term though, these specific emblems are useful because giving a verbal command is not appropriate in all situations that we might find ourselves in, such as a funeral or in the middle of office hours with a professor. The third form of non-verbal communication I will discuss is eye contact, which is a dimension of oculusics. In this case, it was induced by concern for the well-being of a close relational partner. Judge obviously cannot say things to me in English. This picture was taken directly after I had just completed a final exam a few years ago and was being picked up to go back home and relax. I was actually starting to shed emotional tears and a combination of gratitude that the test was finally over and fear I had performed poorly. Concerned by my distress, Judge jumped up to put his four paws onto my torso in order to bring our eyes closer together. In class, we talked about the U and Noise 2015 article that discussed recognition of facial expressions of negative emotions in romantic relationships. While Judge and I do not have a romantic relationship, I would argue that our bond is just as strong. Basically, the article reveals that relationships that were most successful also had the greatest amount of recognition of negative emotions in facial expressions. Judge does a very good job at decoding my emotional state and was quick to take action to alleviate my negative emotions. In the short term, his reaction of jumping up on me and meeting my gaze made me smile and shifted my focus away from the disastrous exam I had just sat through. In the long term though, the eye contact we both give each other successfully calms us both in moments of distress. It also allows for both of us to occasionally meet each other's gaze to judge each other's emotional state. 
When I talked about touch, I alluded that the presence of touch, unintended or not, can help center me. For me, this part of the touch concept extends to the fourth form of nonverbal communication we are going to discuss, the intimate space zone, a specific portion of the more broad category of proxemics. This intimate space zone is defined in Edward T. Hall's description of intimate space zones in his 1966 book, The Hidden Dimension. This clip of me giving Judge a bear hug is an example of me allowing him into my intimate space zone and me into his. As you see, Judge is in my intimate space zone of 0 to 18 inches, which according to Hall's description of intimate space zones involves embracing, touching, or whispering. Yes, Judge is half up on my lap, but I am also violating Judge's intimate space zone by embracing him in a bear hug. We are okay with being this close to one another because we have an emotional closeness as represented by our handler and service dog relationship. The bear hug I give him also indicates this as we are comfortable enough with each other to enter each other's intimate space without facing any repercussions or rebukes that a stranger might encounter if invading our intimate space zones. In the short term, being comfortable in each other's intimate space zone is important for us to be able to act as a team. Judge needs to be able to walk directly next to me, using his body weight to counterbalance me. In the long term, it is good that we can get this close comfortably, as it makes occasional trips to the vet a much less stressful endeavor, as I reassure him to trust the vet, and that they only have his best interest in mind when they approach him. The final form of nonverbal communication we are going to discuss is adornment. An adornment, which relates to physical appearance, is generally an accessory or ornament worn to enhance the beauty of or communicate the status of the wearer. In this clip I am dressing Judge in his service dog vest, which is an example of an adornment that we employ before and during our interactions with the general public. Under the law, service dogs are not required to wear a vest, but I try to always dress Judge with one before we go into public. This adornment is red and attention-getting, especially against Judge's black fur coat. It has phrases sewn to it, which are in themselves, examples of non-verbal communication. They indicate that Judge is a service dog, and to please not distract and or touch him because he is working. The short-term benefit of the adornment is giving us more personal space, as to our relief, we tend not to be crowded by strangers when the vest is on. It also allows Judge and I to travel through the public space with less interruptions by unwanted interactions. The long-term benefit of this adornment is we can always enter buildings and public spaces that have a no-pet policy because the adornment indicates that that the policy is not applicable to judge as service dogs are exempt from it. If he was not wearing the vest, I would have to take time to explain that not all disabilities are visible, judge as my service dog, cite specific portions of the law until the business owner or whomever would begrudgingly let us pass. I would also like to mention that in a similar fashion, occasionally the adornment judge displays is ignored by a stranger and they try and pet him. This is not appreciated by either of us, but I use their encroachment of our personal space as an opportunity to educate them, verbally, about what is okay and not okay when interacting with other service dog teams that they may encounter in the future. We hope you all enjoyed our presentation. The next slide includes my references, so please feel free to pause the video to go through them. Thank you all so much, and I hope the rest of your semester goes well.